Uh, this morning we are going to continue in our journey through the book of Philippians. We've made it all the way to chapter 3. Probably won't finish chapter 3 today. Just going to let that one out of the bag for now. But we'll do a holiday-themed type message next week, I'm sure. Uh, I'll invite you to follow along in your Bibles. If you turn to Philippians chapter 3, we'll probably be all over the place again. And uh, as you're turning to Philippians chapter 3, let's open in another word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, I do thank you again for the opportunity to preach your word, to hear your word, to grow in the knowledge of the truth. I'm thankful for the opportunity to broadcast this to many that may not be sitting here in this room with us, but that still desire to hear your holy word. It is a daunting task to preach your word, rightly divided, properly, but I'm thankful for the opportunity and thankful, Lord, that I'm just thankful for the beautiful message that you've given to us of the glorious gospel of your grace, the amazing work that you've done through Jesus Christ, and the amazing motivation that is to make each day count. And I thank you, Lord, that we've come this far in the book of Philippians, learning much about the idea of servitude, gratitude, and now zeal. And I pray that, I pray for the church, the entire body of Christ, that we may stand strong in your power and might, that we may continue to be fully equipped with your armor, knowing what the wiles of the devil are, knowing that subtly he will sneak in temptations here and there. And I pray we stand strong for the truth, that we don't give in to worldly things, things we may boast of like we're going to read about, but to press toward that mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So may you embolden us to live and share your gospel every day for your glory. In Christ's name, amen. <clears throat> I think I'd like to start this morning by reading through the first 11 verses of the book of Philippians chapter 3. Paul writes, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision, which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcise the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, in Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. I pause there because there's finally a period. But you can see it's Paul's growing intensity that he's putting behind these words. Just by reading it, I perceive the way he might have been feeling it. Now, we've talked a lot about these verses, coming back to the first three verses and discussing the real validity of the nation of Israel, national Israel. Right? Israel <clears throat> is still God's chosen nation, but uh, we know through studying the scriptures that he had, God had dismantled that wall of partition between Jew and Gentile. Right? It's no longer the Jew which is exalted above all and those dirty dog Gentiles, but rather those Gentiles which were afar off or brought nigh by the blood of Christ. 
And now the two, the Jew and the Gentile, are both one in Christ, the body of Christ. God made peace through the two, making them into one body. Okay, we talked about this in Ephesians 2 and 3, uh, studying in depth those verses in particular in Ephesians 2, how we used to be, Gentiles used to be that uncircumcision, called that way by those that are the circumcision of the flesh. And I brought this up because of Philippians chapter 3, verse 2, says, talking about beware of the concision. And this is a particular group of Jews that I've come to understand that would preach the works of the law and never the righteousness which is by faith. To differentiate from that, we have verse 3, comes right after, saying, We are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit. If you turn with me to Romans chapter 2. I've said this in passing, but I wanted to go there this morning. That the true Jew is divined here at the end of Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2 and verse 28. He says, Paul writes this, he says, For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. I just want to pause again here and remind us that we went through the Old Testament and looked how often God spoke of the circumcision of the heart. And there were several occasions, I just gave you a handful, I'll cite them here in case you want to go back and look at them. Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 16. Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 6. Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 4. That one's the easy one to remember. Their chapter and verse are the same. Or for the opposite effect. Oh, man. Hopefully you got some extra fingers. If you'd like to turn to Ezekiel chapter 44. Here, when I mean opposite effect, I mean he's talking of the uncircumcised in heart. And by no means is this all inclusive. If you'd like, a, in my opinion, eye-opening study, look for all this circumcision of the heart type verses, or uncircumcised in heart. Ezekiel chapter 44, and look in verse, beginning in verse 6. <clears throat> Ezekiel chapter 44, <clears throat> excuse me, in verse 6, see, it's written, and thou shalt say to the rebellious, even to the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, O ye house of Israel, let it suffice you of all your abominations, in that you have brought into my sanctuary strangers uncircumcised in heart and uncircumcised in flesh, to be in my sanctuary to pollute it, even my house, when ye offer my bread, the fat and the blood, and they have broken my covenant because of all your abominations. And ye have not kept the charge of mine holy things, but ye have set keepers of my charge in my sanctuary for yourselves. Thus saith the Lord God, No stranger uncirc uncircumcised in heart, nor uncircumcised in flesh, shall enter into my sanctuary, for any stranger that is among the, of any stranger that is among the children of Israel. And the Levites that are gone away from me, when Israel went astray, which went astray away from me after their idols, they shall even bear their iniquity. So it's not a pretty picture here, Ezekiel chapter 44. <clears throat> but here you see the strong language of those that are uncircumcised in heart and in flesh. And I could really go off on a rabbit trail here, speaking of the things under the law and how strict and important that those things were. Typically, the result is if they don't do it, they died. Right? So stakes were very high to do things properly, cleanly, uh, especially in the holy place and the holy of holies, because there was the risk of death, risk of death due to uncleanness. But coming back to Romans chapter two, <clears throat> the one true or the true Jew, oh boy, true Jew, just. Try to figure out what I was saying there. 
is one who is circumcised in the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter whose praise is not of men, but of God. But it doesn't end there. Chapter 3 <clears throat> continues, What advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? And here we're going into this great understanding all the way through chapter 11. Right? Because this is the true Jew defined by their faith, as it is written, Habakkuk 2, 4, the just shall live by faith, not by the works alone. <clears throat> and now he asks, what advantage is the Jew? Because they are a separate entity. Right? We can identify them as a separate entity. I know in Christ there's no difference. But it, what advantage there is? For the Jew, much in every way, chiefly because unto them were committed the oracles of God. They had the word of God at their disposal. But verse 3 proposes an interesting question. What if some of them did not believe? <clears throat> because clearly, throughout Scripture, not the entire nation of Israel had sincere faith. So because of that, shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? Was God unfaithful? Was that in vain? Or, or however you'd like to somewhat rephrase that without taking away the meeting. Mean, meaning. I'm having a little problem with my tongue this morning. He says, God forbid, or may it never be, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. <clears throat> and he's going to go on uh, from there. But all of this to show that Israel is still a valid entity. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. However, what we read through scriptures is that God made certain promises to national Israel. And he's made certain promises to us today, the body of Christ. And here's where that phrase, to rightly divide the truth, comes in. I guess that's the end of that sentence. Comes in. I don't know how I was going to end that. Thank you. There's something tickling the back of my throat. I appreciate that. <coughs> you have these imperfect bodies. Thank you. Hopefully that will help. Well, we get the understanding. What uh, The broader point that I tried to make for a number of weeks is that Israel is a separate entity, uh, but God is not dealing exclusively with, with them today. We read the transition of under law to under grace in the book of Acts, specifically chapters 1 through 15. And chapter 15 correlates with Galatians 2. So hopefully we've, we remember all of that, we've seen all of that, but understanding that there still is work to be done with national Israel, we can be more relaxed with passages such as what we just read in Romans chapter 3, and especially Galatians 6 verses 15 and 16 when it talks of the Israel of God. Right, Most people have a little bit of confusion about that one, but uh, what I've shown is that Israel, again, is still a valid entity. And in that context, he says, as many as walk by this rule where there is no difference, peace and mercy be on them and on the Israel of God. Because we look forward to that fullness of national Israel. Their fullness has not yet come in. That will happen later. Right, uh, The timeline of God, as I see it, I, I'll put myself out there, that's fine, but I have yet to see Scripture contradict this, is that after this age of grace <clears throat> ends with the catching away of the body of Christ, most call that the rapture, then comes the tribulation period, the last seven years determined upon Israel and upon Jerusalem, like we read in Daniel, then comes the millennial kingdom period of the thousand year reign with Jesus ruling with that rod of iron, immediate justice. He's going to keep order in the entire world. There will be rebels during that time frame, but they won't get anywhere. So it will be a time of rest, a time of peace. And then Satan will be let loose for a little season, if you read Revelation 20, to gather up all those that rebel against Christ, bring them to Christ so he can dispose of them all at once. Kind of nice, to put it that way, that he has Satan do all that dirty work. But then comes the great white throne judgment. The current heaven and earth flee away from the presence of God. This is like so awesome, mind-blowing to me. That, that no one, or we're just hanging out in the ethereal nothing, you could call it. But uh, the great white throne judgment takes place 
to put all those that have rejected God and His Christ where they wanted to go. And I wanted to phrase it that way because everyone chooses their eternal destination. Everyone chooses this. You can choose to be with Christ in paradise for all eternity. You can choose to be in what is called the lake of fire <coughs> in Scripture. Also for all eternity, where God says the, the fire is not quenched, the smoke of their torment rises day and night. Um, it's, it's the worst place imaginable. And for those interested I wanted to show a video of what burning brimstone looks like. It literally does look like a lake of fire. So I'll be doing that next week, probably, unless I figure out some holiday-themed something to do for the Sunday school portion. Uh, but probably continuing in Revelation to view that video for those that are interested. Or you can just look on YouTube. They're there. How did we get there? Everyone chooses their eternal destination. That's where I'm getting at. So this is the broad time frame of God, and then after... The great white throne judgment, Jesus, God, is going to make a brand new heavens, a brand new earth. New Jerusalem is so magnificent, again, beyond imagination. We can read about it and get an idea about it in Revelation chapter 21 and 22. But it's going to be so far good above our imaginations. Uh, it's just, I don't know, I can't describe it. Indescribable, it's that good. I can't describe it. Uh, but that's what Romans 18 talks about. Right? The sufferings of this present world are not even worthy to compare of that which we have to look forward to. And the whole creation groans and travails for that time. Boy, that statement is so true. I'm so looking forward to that time when God makes all things new. Now here we've been looking in Romans 3. Uh, that uh, what it says there, what if some of them had unbelief? Well, they are not all Israel which are of Israel, we read in Romans 9, meaning they're not all children of the promise, meaning they don't all have faith. But it's because they sought the righteousness of the works rather than the righteousness of God which is by faith, which is far and above superior. Okay, I, I'll get off on tangents if I keep doing that. Come back with me to Philippians chapter 3. So he says in Philippians 3, verse 3, that we, the saints of today, are the circumcision. Not that we have replaced national Israel, but that we have the circumcision of the heart. We have the sincere faith, worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Jesus Christ, and have no confidence in the flesh. Right? And when I read that, I thought immediately of Romans 7:18. Why do we have no confidence in my flesh? Romans 7, 18 says, In my flesh dwelleth no good thing. And this flesh is the thing we wrestle with. Probably tell I'm wrestling with it already this morning. My tongue is not keeping up with my brain. I got the tickle in my throat, which is now gone. So thank you for that assist with the water again. Uh, I still deal with digestive issues. It goes at ups and downs. And like I was chatting with even a couple of you this morning, everybody's body has something that reminds us that we're not immortal. Right? We're not there yet. Uh, Paul writes about having a thorn in his flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet him, lest he become, how does it say, wise in his own conceits or something like that, but, uh, uh, or uh, boasting above measure, right? He, he, it kept him in line. Like, yes, I need this to remain humble. I'm refraining again from side trailing here. But all that we know that in our flesh dwelleth no good thing. Even if we wanted to boast in the flesh, Paul says, I got more than any of that. And before we even could come back with a rebuttal, he comes back to Scripture. Okay? Most of us can boast of some things, some talents, some whatever that we have done, trophies that we may still have in our house. I had a whole bunch, a lot of those are in the landfill now. Right? And you think, that's, think about it, that's where they all end up going anyway. The works of the hands. But he says, I might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he has confidence to trust in the flesh, I got more. To paraphrase verse 4. Circumcise the eighth day. That's done according to the law. Leviticus chapter 12. Has its roots in Genesis chapter 17. Circumcision was required for the nation of Israel or they would be cut off from the promises. They had to do it. Today, Galatians 5 says, If you get circumcised, and Christ shall profit you nothing. How do you reconcile both of those? You see the transition from under law to under grace. Okay, so again, I hopefully don't need to go through that, but <clears throat> what Christ did 
on the cross, has took all that, the law and the ordinances and those things that were contrary to us, nailed them to his cross, taking them out of the way, and we have liberty now in Christ Jesus. All things are lawful unto me, but not all things are expedient. So there is that expected behavior which I want to get to a little bit later this morning. He is circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel. To be natural born Israel is a step ahead already of the rest. What profit, what advantage then hath the Jew much in every way, chiefly because unto them were committed the oracles of God. So now those that were born in Israel would have the oracles of God at their disposal. Right. I almost said disposition. I think that still works, but I'm not an English major. So you get what you get. <clears throat> So he's of the stock of Israel, so he's a step ahead of the rest in that sense. Of the tribe of Benjamin, so he knows his genealogy. In Hebrew, of the Hebrews, that means there was no taint in his bloodline. They were all strictly Hebrews of the tribe of Benjamin. right? Because they were supposed to keep the inheritance within their tribe. Now you can read through all the Old Testament, all that stuff that they had to keep track of. <clears throat> but today, these, those endless genealogies, as Paul writes to Timothy, just leads to ungodliness. Now, we don't need to talk about that anymore. Talk about what Christ did. Glory in the cross. Thank goodness. As touching the law of Pharisees. So you know he was of the strictest sect of following the law. He, he studied at the feet of Gamaliel, uh, which you can read about as well, and, and hear about Gamaliel in Acts chapter 5. So he was one of those prominent teachers in Israel and he learned to be so zealous for those traditions that he says here in verse 6, concerning zeal persecuting the church. He believed in his heart that Jesus was not the Messiah, and he persecuted to the death those that would dare say he was. Right? And this was Paul. This was who? Well, Saul of Tarsus. That's who Saul of Tarsus was. <clears throat> but he was separated, he said, under the grace of God, because God had chosen him to be that vessel unto the Gentiles, knowing who Paul was and what he would do. And so he says, uh, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. My body would catch up here. So we recognize, I know I talked about this last week, I asked the question, could anybody keep the law? Because most of us here have probably heard the fact that someone would say, nobody could ever keep the law. But according to Scripture, I know of at least three people that did. And that would be Paul, as he says right here, and Zechariah and Elizabeth, as it says in Luke chapter 1. Could you keep it perfectly so that you never sinned? No, not at all. <clears throat> but when the sin was made known, you can talk about sins of, of ignorance. When they become known, then the proper sacrifice or the proper ritual had to be done to be ritually clean again and take part in the temple services. So, uh, concerning the righteousness of the law, blameless. But look what else Paul says about this, beginning here in verse 7. He says, But what things were gained to me, what things were gained to me, and a reminder of Galatians 1, how he says, I profited above all my brethren, or something like that, in the religion of the Jews. Those things that were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of of what? The knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. Knowing him trumps all of that stuff. And so last week, I think that was last week, he either said this or I imagined it, so I'm going to say it this morning. <laughs> Is that me today? Right? That's the question we can challenge ourselves with. Those things of the flesh, those things that I've earned, right, that we perceive anyway, that we've earned, worked for, earned, <clears throat> are all those things loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. Do I count knowing Christ above all those things? There's another way you could put it. Right? And that, that was a challenge, a very convicting thing to me way back when. It still is, uh, by all means, but way back when, when I valued things of the world still, right, when I was still maturing in Christ, that would make me think better of, well, I don't have to put hours into this anymore. I should really focus on knowing Him. Right, so that's essentially what my attitude was and gradually became more and more dominant in my attitude. Not to say I'm perfect by any means, but is that us? Right? This is Paul, and remember Paul says, even here in Philippians, he's going to say, follow after me. Right? Do the same thing. 
I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And you think about that too. He had a lot. He had wealth. He had prestige. He had power. He was going to the high priest to get all those letters so he could go to wherever he wanted and drag people out of their homes, right? He was given this authority to persecute the church. So he had his connections, but uh, he counts all of that as loss and has suffered the loss of all things. Do count them but dung that I may win Christ. Christ is so far and above superior that all those things of the flesh, all those things that he even lusted after the flesh, you could say, is just so despicable, so despised now in his eyes compared to the excellency of Jesus Christ. Not only to win Christ, but verse 9, to be found in him, to be found in Christ, not having mine own righteousness, which of, is of the law, which he had. Right back in verse 6, he had the righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. And there's much more I could be that could be said about that. The righteousness of the law is that which we can earn, that which we can do, that which is predominantly used in every religion of the world. These works of the flesh. And what that does is produce an attitude of fear because it keeps the people coming back in order to make sure they adhere to whatever doctrine needs to be adhered to to be accepted. And I think that's a fairly decent way to summarize it. And it goes by all sorts of different names, denominations, religions, cults. I mean, we could name a whole bunch if we wanted to, but all of them end up being the same. It's this works of religion of works that you never know, am I good enough? Never know. Christianity is so much different. You can know for absolute certainty that you will be in eternal paradise. And it takes one simple thing, faith. Right? That's exactly what it says here. Through the faith of Christ, that means Christ's faith, his faithfulness. And I lost my spot. Verse 9, through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God. Again, this is God's faithfulness by faith. So when my faith aligns with his faithfulness in that very moment of sincere faith, <laughs> just thought of the magic happens. Like everything happens in that one moment, right? God recognizes that. He seals the believer with his Holy Spirit unto the day of redemption. That's Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. And we're going to read here that he shall change in verse 21. If you look down there, he shall change our vile body. Sure feels vile to me right now. It's not behaving. That it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, Jesus Christ's resurrected body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Right, this, is the, this is the future we have to look forward to. A brand new body that works flawlessly. Let that be today. Maybe next week. Who knows? A lot of hype out there in prophecy land. Let's put it that way. I don't want to digress into that. Uh, but do you see the, the great, vast difference of the works which are of the flesh, the lusts of the flesh, I even could say, or that following after the Spirit, winning Christ, the righteousness of God? It's on a whole other level. It's way above and superior to those things of the flesh. <clears throat> And Paul says, I got rid of all of that. And I count them but dung that I may win Christ. Verse 10, he says, that I may know him. And the power of his resurrection, that power, ability, dunamis in the Greek, of his resurrection, that I may know that. And the fellowship of, of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. And that's the part that most of us don't look forward to. But we recognize it immediately uh, when we start to preach and live godly. God says that those that live godly shall suffer persecution. That's in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12. But this is his desire to know the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. And that's that given if. 
He knows it's going to happen. It's, you could translate it since. It doesn't quite work, maybe in this context, but you know it's a given thing that I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. We know it's going to happen. Because, I've, because of my faith, I've been baptized into Christ by the Holy Spirit and been made conformable unto his death, like it says here in chapter 10. You can read about almost this exact same thing in Romans chapter 6. Know ye not that those of us that have baptized into Christ are were baptized into his death? And later on in verse 4, I just want to make sure I got the words right. Even so also should we walk in newness of life. We know that this is us. This is part of our identity in Christ Jesus. We know that he will give us this resurrection at some point. So we ought to live, right? There's that expectation of the child of God, how we ought to live, what we ought to do with our day to day. Now, summarily, like it says in Romans 13, 9, to uh, love thy neighbor as thyself. If there be any other commandment, right? It says summarily is, the, is one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I got that part right. But you can read about it in Romans chapter 13 and verse 9. To live for Christ, <clears throat> to tie in a couple of things we've talked about the last two weeks, about celebrating Christmas or not, it's like every week more and more of these people are saying, you can't do it, it's pagan, it's, it's, it's uh, built upon paganistic practices. Yeah, but is anybody really doing that today? I don't know, maybe some are, but very few are. And again, the tree is not evil in and of itself. Tempted again to go down that rabbit trail. Some people cite verses of the Old Testament, totally forget the context. Right? They cite these things like, oh, you can't do silver and gold on the tree because that's what Jeremiah 10 says. And like right after that it says, they bow down and worship it or something along those lines. We're not worshiping the tree. <laughs> okay? You could say that about every decoration in your house. Every one of those decorations, no matter what it is, could be an idol. <clears throat> it could also just be a decoration and you can glorify God for it. Right? They're not evil in and of itself. That's the meaning of Romans 14. Hopefully that's all good by us here before I get all into that again. But we should ab uh, abstain from all appearance of evil. Right? That's what it says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 22. Yeah, that's exactly what it says. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Uh, we've talked about, read about 1 Corinthians 8, Romans 14. It has kind of that same thing. If you're going to eat food, if you're going to go to a feast, and they say, well, this is a sacrifice to idols, don't eat it. It's for their conscience sake. You know that meat is just meat. It'll fill your belly. It'll be just fine. But because of their conscience, thinking this was sacrificed to idols, which are evil. So if you're trying to combine those two words, that's what almost came out of my mouth. <clears throat> it is evil in that sense. So we're going to abstain from the appearance of evil so we don't damage our brother or sister's conscience. Right? We can't be quiet about such things, and those things will come up in your lives, in my life, like water baptism. That's come up probably the most in my life. And I've shared with you before that one of those times, actually three separate occasions where I got yelled at because I would say we don't need to water baptize today even though they said, well, Jesus did it. Like, yeah, but he came to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and tried to explain it from that perspective and to be that high priest and all of that. It was some intense fellowship. Amen. <laughs> but to be found not having mine own righteousness, which of the law, but to have that righteousness, which is of God by faith, is so much far and superior. And I pick on water baptism. We could pick on a number of things that I've known or grown up with. You could probably add to this list. I'm not, this is not an all-inclusive list. Some, finally, some receiving communion every week, that is so important to them. I had a particular lady say, we have to do this every week so I know my sins are forgiven. I'm like, oh boy, let me tell you about the liberty in Christ. Right? And I don't think that was even received at that point. But who knows if it is now? That was years and years ago. Confessing sins to another man. Some of you had to do that. Some of you grew up knowing someone doing that. We don't have to do that. But if you look in the Bible, it's there. Making confession for the sins of Israel to the priest. It's there, but it's for the nation Israel because of the priesthood. And again, we could go down that rabbit trail and spend a couple weeks 
studying that. But that's there for, that was under the priesthood. We have liberty in Christ. We already are complete in Christ. Colossians 2 could not be clearer. You're complete in Christ. Having all trespasses forgiven. All means all. Now, there's no, what do you even call that? Uh, exegetical gymnastics that you could do to change that word into all means some. Right? Or uh, just until the ones, uh, up until now. Not the future sins. Now, some people try to say that. No. <clears throat> all means all. Christ died 2,000 years ago. I was entirely future from that point of view. But uh, all means all. We're, completed, we're completely separated from our sins because of God's faithfulness. So all glory comes to God. Uh, keeping the Ten Commandments, some are adamant about that. I'm reminded of, if some of you know Ray Comfort's ministry, I forget what the name of it is, but that's how he would evangelize. He'd challenge people about to see how good enough they were to get into heaven. He was using the law lawfully. It points out sin. So that's what he was doing and asking them, have you done this? Have you done that? Have you, you know, murdered anybody? No, no, I haven't done that. Have you ever told a lie? Well, yeah. Have you ever stolen anything? Yup. You know, so he'd point out that, well, you've sinned according to the ten we didn't even make it through all the Ten Commandments, and he'd give them the name, you're lying, thieving, you know, whatever, something like that. I, I watched these things a long time ago, so uh, that's out there somewhere. But still, he would come to the point of, you need a Savior. You need to fix this somehow. So either you got to earn it, or you just accept the free gift of Christ. And he would share the gospel, that Christ would free them from all their sin. Great. But some think they have to keep the Ten Commandments, and that's still falling under, I need to be good enough or being brought under bondage, under fear, again. Some will say words like this, you need to receive Jesus into your heart. Okay. I know, we're going to nitpick on some words, aren't we? But if, if people don't know what that means, go ahead and say that. I'm not going to have any problem against it, but let them know what it means. That means you're safe and secure in Christ, you're forgiven all sins, forgiven all trespasses. Go over the identity of Christ. Show them the scriptures, Ephesians 1, 2, 3, like all those things that we've been talking about. To receive them into your heart means to sincerely believe Jesus died, was buried, rose again the third day. Right? Define it. If it's this discombobulated message, people are going to come to the altar, right? That's another one. We need to do altar calls. Oh boy, this is just some wood beautifully placed together. It's got some nicks and scuffs in it, but you know, whatever. It has no power, right? I could invite all of you to come up here and say, yes, I believe in Christ, but you don't have to. <laughs> it's the, the only reason anybody's ever saved is by faith, and you don't need any public announcement at all. You want to make a public announcement for the gospel of Jesus Christ? Go for it. You want an excuse to stand by a, a, a piece of wood? Okay. <laughs> right? And if I say it like that, then you know, it sounds a little silly, but if anyone wants to come up here, and I'm not inviting you right now, but if you really want to, go ahead, to share your testimony. Right? Sharing the testimony of how God has worked in your life is one of the most powerful witnessing tools. I believe that. Uh, in... in, in even if I can't express it properly, I sincerely believe it. Hey, just sharing your testimony, the way God worked through you in your life, and how you know that there is a real God. Or praying the sinner's prayer. Right? If we're going to pray a rehearsed prayer, the words aren't going to mean as much. If it comes from the heart, then it's sincere. And that's the whole point of getting at these about the altar call and, and all that sort of thing. It only makes a difference if it's really from the heart. And God knows the heart of all men. So we can't, we can fool people. Many people have confessed, so I, I rededicated my life to God. Now, that makes me wonder if they were dedicated to begin with, this is just the way the mind goes, right? I sincerely hope they did trust in Christ and then lived in ignorance until they said, I, now I rededicated my life. I had a very similar experience to that. I trusted in the gospel. I tried to open the Bible. I had no idea what it meant, so it was shut. Right? I, I told you before, I, I feel like I wasted 12 years of my life because I didn't study the scriptures or get to know the one God that saved me. But then I rededicated my life to him too. But it wasn't through an altar call. It was through a heartfelt prayer. And nobody was around. It doesn't have to go through the fanfare or anything like that. It's just sincere faith. Right? Salvation is none of those things that we just mentioned. Salvation from sin and death is through faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith in Habakkuk 2.4, Romans 1.17.
Nothing compares to the liberty we have in Christ. I'm, see, I, I can't even get past all this stuff. I wanted to get to Philippians 3, 12 through 16. I want to get there. I really do. But I, the, the gospel of Christ through faith and all that we have in Christ through faith, the liberty we have in Christ is something to celebrate every single day. Every single day. Thank God that the world, for whatever reason, decides to celebrate the birth of Christ, whether they understand it or not, this time of year. At least it gives us an excuse to talk about the birth of Christ and the even better news, how he died, was buried, and rose again to save the world from their sins. So use anything to our advantage. I talked about the little words, the faith of Christ, the faith of God, and how powerful the message is to know him personally. And I want to really emphasize that this morning. Realize that we were in no way fit to be in the presence of the holy, perfect, and just God. But he did a work so special, so unique, that he broke that wall down. Uh, he, he allowed, he tore that veil in two. He allowed us now to go into the holy of holies, to know him personally. I can't think of any closer closeness than to be in Christ Jesus, right? in him. And he is in me. The Holy Spirit is in me. We get to personally know him, talk to him, get to know him every day. Right? This is a great relationship that God allowed by his sacrifice through Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul is saying is so great of a thing, that I may know him, he says in verse 10, and the power of the resurrection and so forth. So we get to experience that same resurrection power, that same resurrection as it says down at the end of the chapter. We get to experience the persecution for those that live godly. But it's because of that that we realize that there's a choice here. The spiritual battle that we're engaged in, we've got two choices after we come to the saving knowledge of being in Christ. We can either, number one, take on the zeal that we're called to do to press toward that mark, that high calling in Christ Jesus for the prize of that high calling, to equip ourselves to stand strong in the power of the Lord and His might, or turn tail and run, settle for the fire insurance, and that's it. It's essentially what our choice is, right? Try to avoid the persecution. I want to encourage us to be equipped, to set that mark, set the scope there. What is that word? I know it's in here somewhere. Oh, it's down in verse 14. So in Philippians 3.14, when he says, I press toward the mark, that's the Greek term skopos, which does translate in English to scope. That is my scope. I am zeroed in, lasered in, that's where I'm going. Right? And so what we end up seeing here in Philippians chapter 3 is very similar to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, one of those great, encouraging, what I view as a coach to his players kind of speeches. I'm not fighting as one that beats the air. I'm going for it. Now you do it. Right? That's essentially what he's saying in 1 Corinthians 9. That's what he's saying right here too. I press toward that mark. My scope is right there and I'm going for it. Because we are going to receive the rewards of Jesus Christ. Well, we read in several places of that. 1 Corinthians 3 is the first one that comes to mind. I wasn't planning on going there for the sake of time, because I'm already running out of that. But in 1 Corinthians 3, how it talks about the Bema seat rewards of Christ, the, uh, the precious jewels compared to the flammable commodities. Right? And if you turn tail and run, right, that choice of turning tail and run, settling for the proverbial fire insurance, the lake of fire, all the works that that person's going to do, gone. They're going to suffer loss, yet be saved as, so by, as by fire. Right? Just like it says in 1 Corinthians 3. But even so, at the end of all that, never forget 1 Corinthians 4, 5, every man shall have praise of God. Right? Even though we pass through that, we're going to suffer losses of things done in the flesh, we're still in eternity with Christ Jesus. Right? We still get to be saved from all of that, and, and nobody's perfect. I don't want to get anybody down or guilt anybody uh, at all, but uh, what my desire is to encourage us to live as God wanted us to through Jesus Christ. Okay? And the truth is such a thrill of discovery. Like, I can hardly express, when I first came unto the knowledge of the truth, what a joy that was to know of my liberty in Christ Jesus. Because I was under bondage of having to pray the Lord's Prayer every day, and twice on Sundays, if you remember me sharing about that, that was a legalistic thing that I was taught to do. That's your prayer life, you do it. So I, I, I was freed from that. I was freed from other things, which I didn't yet realize. 
But the more I read and discovered about my identity in Christ, the more I wanted to know. It's that thrill of discovery, and, and this is who God is. Like you get to, re, to realize and internalize God's character. The more you read through Scripture, here's who he is. Right? I am a jealous God. I don't want you serving or worshiping anything else like you read in the Old Testament. You can read and, and, and get to know God's character in any verse, any passage. But you know, he's just, he wants us to be true to him. And how true is that that everybody realizes that this side of eternity? Right? It's always, well, maybe not today anymore, but a scandal for an adulterous relationship. Right? That's supposed to be a scandal. It's starting to go by the wayside in our generation, which is just insanity. But people realize the, the impact of infidelity. And that's what, isn't that what God is saying in Exodus? I am a jealous God. Don't worship other gods. Just come to me. Right? Even in that, I see his great love wherewith he loved us toward Jesus Christ. That just verse came to my mind. But he's, that great love toward his people, just worship me. Leave all that stuff away. Get all that out of you, Israel, which he's talking to in Exodus 20. I'm never going to get there. Let me just summarize this. I want to get there. Let me just summarize this with the order of God's will. Be saved. That's the number one. Be saved, right? 1 Timothy 2.4. Come unto the knowledge of the truth, joy of discovery. It's awesome. Get to know who Christ is, who you are in Christ, and what he made you to be. The new creature, creation in Christ Jesus, created unto good works. Okay? Come unto the knowledge of truth, then act like it. Right? Now that I know who I am, now I can behave. It's the true outward sign of the inward change. Okay, let's read Philippians 3, 12 to 16. This will be part one. Oy. It's all good news. I can hardly get past it. The good news is just that good. But look at what he says here. He says, Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend, that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded, and if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. Now reading through that quickly, a lot of it probably just went whoosh, right over the head. Because I had to read this probably a thousand times before I got half of it. <laughs> and it has part to do with translating English back into English. And I promised you a linguistic experience, and here we go from the fire hose, drinking from the fire hose. Not as though I had already attained, as in the aorist indicative active. I haven't gotten there yet, is essentially what he's saying. Okay. I'll give you the technical terms, but then I'll give you the layman terms as best to my knowledge. I haven't gotten there yet, verse 12, and what is he talking about? The resurrection of the dead. I don't have my new body yet, but I know it's coming. It's a given, it's coming to me. Ne either were already perfect, and the term perfect in the Greek here is teleioo, which is a fun verb to say, but it's the same root of what Christ said on the cross, tetelestai, it is finished. Okay, so that's the idea here, finished, come to completion, matured. Okay, that's the idea of that term, neither were already perfect, because if you look at verse 12, he's saying, I was not already perfect, and then in verse 15, he says, let us therefore as many as be perfect. Most of us scratch our head, what, Paul? What does that mean? Uh, but again, following it in the context, I have not attained yet to the resurrection of the dead. I don't have that perfect body yet. Right? I'm not there yet. I'm still wrestling in this flesh, Romans 7. I've been delivered from the body of this death. I can rejoice in Christ Jesus that I'm going to have a new body like unto his, but I'm not there yet. Does that help make sense of that first verse 12 anyway? First half of verse 12, see. But I follow after if, and that's the Greek term since again, E-I-I, since, or I will be apprehended that for which I also am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Now I had to go back and figure out what, is, what are the verbs here? What's really being done? Yeah, untangle this mess. So when he says attained in verse 12, that's the Greek term lambano. It means to receive, 
to lay hold of or to attain. Okay, it's totally legitimate translation. But when you get to the word apprehended, this is kata lambano. So it's this, this receiving with a little extra oomph. Okay, that's what kata does or the prefix means. Uh, it literally is, I didn't write it down. It means down toward or down against. That's typically what kata means, kata, however you say that. But instead of just laying hold, it's laying a tight hold of or seizing or overtaking, not just this receiving. Uh, apprehend does have that meaning, right? It's like taking with force. So it's a perfectly, again, legitimate translation, but I'm just trying to help us understand what is being said here. So I'm not already there. I don't have the body yet. I'm not perfect yet, but I follow after, and that term is dioko, I think, which means to pursue. Right? It's just to chase after it. I think the official uh, definition, wherever I wrote that down, it's somewhere in my notes. I'm just not there. It's to chase after, there we go, aggressively chase like a hunter pursuing a catch. So that's the official definition of I follow after. So again, you see that great encouragement of just go for it. I am following after if or given that I may apprehend. So I'm going to lay hold of that, that for which I also am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Right? And I thought of, I beseech you, brethren, that you walk worthy of this vocation wherewith you have been called. Right? There is this calling, there is this expectation in Christ Jesus, that which I am laid hold of in Christ Jesus. Right? There's this expectation that we live godly, we live as the child of God should, walking circumspectly, redeeming the time, for these days are evil. Right? Abstaining from the, all appearance of evil, uh, praying always, right? and, and giving thanks because this is the will of God concerning Christ Jesus in you. 1 Thessalonians 5, like the whole end of it. Remember that like machine gun commandments at the end there? Uh, all of that stuff. So that's what I'm apprehended of. I'm laid hold of Christ Jesus. Right? He did that to me the moment I put my faith in him. His faithfulness gave me that promise, made me a brand new creature. So now I want to take hold of all of that. Does that help clear that up? There's this expectation, this, this living of uh, this expected living of Christ Jesus, which now he walks, wants us to walk, or wonks us, uh, in our lives. Okay? And so we should lay hold of that. So that's verse 12. I'm not going to do the rest in two minutes. But verse 13, brethren, I count myself to not to have apprehended. I count not myself to have apprehended. So again, that's that same word again. But I'm not there yet. I haven't grabbed hold of it yet. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth unto those things which are before. Now hopefully that one makes sense. I think that one's a lot more straightforward. I have not accounted this. That's the Greek term logizomai, logic. I have not logicked this. It doesn't make sense to do that in English. But you get the idea of I have not accounted it. Uh, to have gotten there. I'm not completely perfect. He still had flaws, right? I'm not, and that's, he's just being candid here, at least my understanding. And when he says apprehended, that's in the perfect tense. So again, it means it's over and done. So I have not gotten there. I'm not totally perfect yet, but what I do for getting those things behind, what are those things? His pedigree in the flesh, right? Circumcised the eighth day, so forth. So all of that is done to win Christ, to know him, to lay hold of those things of Christ and press toward that mark. I don't want to lose my excitement here. Verse 14 says, I press toward that mark. So again, that press toward, same verb as I follow after. I pursued this thing. Okay? I am pressing toward, pursuing, chasing after that scope, that mark, that prize, which literally does mean prize, of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So it's this expectation of I am shooting for that absolute perfect level and I'm just going for it all in. Right? It's, it's that, again, I get this sense of this great message of encouragement that you know, I'm already getting excited, I guess, in my body. Well, I you know, finally got over my whatever was happening inside of me. So, like, I'm really excited to get there. I want to put all my efforts into attaining that for which Christ got a hold of me. 
Right? That's who I want to be. So I'm just going for it. Maybe I can do this in a couple minutes. But we'll do it again next week. You know how I go. Or two weeks from now, as it were. Uh, verse... I know, I'm tempted to go into all these other ones. Maybe I'll just cite them for now. Um, verse, yeah, verse 15. Let us therefore as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And what is he talking about there? Let us that are mature and understand the words that I'm saying, be this minded. You understand who you are in Christ Jesus? Have you been saved? Are you coming to the knowledge of the truth? Have you attained to this level of maturity? then this is your attitude. Hey, this should be your attitude. Let it be. It's a commandment here. But let this, or let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Hey, this is God's Holy Spirit way of guiding us into the way we ought to be. Our flesh is still going to want to, yeah, I'm just going to go do this thing, whatever that thing is, right? I mean, bag on purpose. But we're growing in our maturity in Christ Jesus, you can look back, think about your past life, and you can see where God was at work. Like hindsight is a lot easier to see what's going on in the present. But we can look back and see how God worked in time past and how he has that ability to work out all things for good and to help us align with him, essentially is what it is. His, his attitude, like we've been studying for weeks and weeks, in Philippians 2, let this mind also be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Mature minds should grasp the, con the concept here, is what he's saying. Being in Christ, that position of in Christ, is this awesome privilege. And we see that it comes with this genuine call to zeal of godliness. It's much the same as Titus 2, 11 to 14, where the grace of God hath appeared to all men, and at the end of it, that he should procure unto himself a peculiar people, zealous unto good works. Right? That's what is supposed to happen. Our minds should be transformed. Misquoting Romans 12, but you get the idea. We should be conformed to this world, but by the transforming of our mind, be renewed. I'm botching it up again. Read it on your own. <laughs> God says it better than I do. Uh, but it's kind of the same message, like I said in 1 Corinthians 9. Don't just whimsically go about this life. Right? Focus in. Set that scope, right? I'm using that term. Set that scope, that mark for that high calling in Christ Jesus. So, and verse 16, nevertheless, we're two, we have already attained. So we've learned from when we were babies in Christ Jesus, uh, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. I quote Isaiah in that sense, but this is how we mature in Christ and whatever level we're at, Right? Nevertheless, where two we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. We're all, whether you're down here or up here, we all want to shoot for that mark, that high calling in Christ Jesus. Let's close in prayer. I could go on, but I need to restrain myself. Lord in heaven, thank you for this amazing gospel that produces the zeal in all of us. I thank you, God, for the grace mercy, peace, all those things that we have in Christ Jesus. The great joy that we have in Christ Jesus. The great zeal that we see in others that, that have latched on, as the Apostle Paul has done here, and saying by his example what he is going to do to live out his life dedicated in service to you, which is a reasonable service. So I'm thankful for that example. Thank for the contemporary examples also. And I pray that we continue to do so. Uh, every day, reach for, press toward that mark for the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus, and let nothing get in the way or hinder us. Lord, it's, it's a burden upon my heart how I've heard so many falling away. And I pray that they are restored. I pray that they renew that zeal for your righteousness, your, uh, your character, your holiness, and live for you once again. I don't doubt their salvation, Lord, that's between you and them, but let us hear that are, that are reading these words, listening to your word, not just my message, but your word to, to really focus on a living godly and serving you in all things. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.